around again today. But this was another topic man from the ICP training request. So this was what you all wanted. And so we're excited to be able to host it again today. Um, we've got a great lineup of speakers who are going to really dive into this topic. And it's, it's really telling that this is something that our constituents that are coming into the offices are asking more questions about, uh, want more information on. And so hopefully today this arms you with enough information that you can answer those questions or get our landowners or participants or whoever comes in our office to the right resource in order to support that. So I want to again thank the Indiana Association of Soil and Water Districts for hosting the meeting and the Zoom today. And as Amy said, these will be posted. So we're, we're excited that this will be a long-term resource for everyone involved. So today I'll let the speakers go into their own in-depth um, introductions, but we do have Aaron Stump of the Indiana Wildlife Federation, Jessica Merkling and Aaron Bassinger of the Indiana DNR, and Jared O'Brien from Pollinator Partnership. So I'm excited for all that they're going to be able to share with us today. Before we dive into the meat of the program, I did kind of want to set the stage on the backyard habitat because certainly those of us involved with the Farm Bill get this question a lot. The, the backyard habitat, sort of where does that line fall? Um, with Farm Bill programs, it gets kind of tricky and we, and we know that. But what we're really aiming at here is that the Farm Bill programs are gonna be involved with that food and fiber production. And so if a person is coming in and looking for something that is landscaping or enhancing the, the, the beauty of their property, but they're not in what we would define as true wildlife habitat, if they're not out producing and you know not supplementing their garden or their market garden for with pollinator habitat to, to boost that production for their for their operation, then that's going to fall into that backyard habitat. And, and it is it can be a little gray. We've used some definitions in the past, such as if they're mowing even a large swath of area shorter than six inches, that's not habitat, that's lawn. And at that point, that would fall into not a farm bill program. But again, if they are doing some sort of production, if they're in that non-industrial private forest land, if they are supplementing or using that habitat to, for beneficial insects and pollinator, that's when we can get into the farm bill side of things. It's it's gray and we know that it's going to be individual case by case but we do see more and more landowners coming in that just want pollinator habitat because they they've heard the good things about it they've heard the benefits of uh, gardening with natives so, so we want to make sure that everyone has that opportunity to to either come in and ask those questions if you in your Trying to evaluate, have those questions, definitely float that up to the area offices, the state office, and we can address that as needed. Yeah. So with that, I know that's, that's not a great and detailed definition of what we're doing, but I just wanted to kind of set the stage that we're really today focusing more on those individuals that are looking for this to enhance their, their living space, I guess, more so than we're talking about supplementing that agricultural setting. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to our first speaker. Again, we, we ask that everyone stay on mute, put your questions in the chat. Our first speaker today is Aaron Stump with the Indiana Wildlife Federation. And Aaron, I'm going to hand it over to you. Uh, my name is Aaron Stump. I'm with the Indiana Wildlife Federation, as if you couldn't tell my, by, by my band, by branding here. And what I wanted to share with you guys today was essentially a workshop that I've given uh, hundreds of times. Uh, the people that I normally talk to are uh, homeowners who have some sort of interest in nature. Usually it's pretty surface level interest in nature, but they, they want to know how to, how to expand what they're, what they're seeing. Uh, typically it's things like birds um, in, in a neighborhood setting. So I live in an HOA. I have maybe 100 square feet that I'm allowed to work with as a garden before I start getting letters. And I wanted to help people like me uh, figure out what they can do to create uh, wildlife spaces uh, where they live, quality wildlife spaces where they live, and to really help them understand what we mean when we talk about uh, providing for wildlife, because I think a lot of us have different concepts of what wildlife actually means for uh, for a neighborhood garden. So 
I sort of boiled down that workshop a little bit to talk about, uh, I, I kind of got over, got rid of the invasive part, which I, I realize now is a, a big chunk of it, obviously important, but uh, I'm going to go over essentially what I deliver to people to try to convince them that not only should they be providing for nature, um, but that there's ways they can do it in their neighborhood that's going to be giving back to wildlife, but it's also going to be giving something uh, to them. I start off with the same spiel basically every single time I give this workshop. I always refer to native plants as the foundation of all conservation. So it doesn't matter what people care about. They have to start with native plants. So one of the groups that I talk to, I would say pro predominantly, more about 70% about of the groups that I talk to tend to be uh, gardening groups. They're not native gardening groups, but they're gardening groups. It's somewhat easy to get those folks to uh, try out new plants. Uh, they're already excited about getting out in their garden. They're already excited about getting their fingers dirty and and they want to have plants that uh, nobody else really has. And for the most part, I find that they have ornamental plants. So native plants are something new for them um, to try out. Now, the the big point here is to is to demonstrate to people that a backyard habitat is not having a birdhouse and a bird feeder sitting out in the middle of a mowed lawn, right? You, you already know that. Uh, a habitat's a little bit more than that. It's an ecosystem and it has to start with these native plants. And I also have a little bit of a hidden agenda in that uh, my one of my big goals with my educational workshops is that I want to validate insects. I, I, I don't necessarily want to, I don't need to convince people that insects are as great as I think they are, but I definitely want to take some of those stigmas away from insects and what they mean to gardeners uh, because of the value that they have in an ecosystem. So I find that insects are actually a major opportunity for an ecological win, even in uh, habitats that are small and fragmented like neighborhoods are. So like I said, if you just have 100 square feet to garden with, you're not going to be attracting bobcats, you're not going to be attracting owls, things like that. But you can actually provide a pretty quality habitat for insects so long as you do it right. And not only is that sort of a personal win for me, but it's a huge ecological win. We have a massive decline in insect species uh, all over the world, but, but right here in the United States, right here in Indiana as well, we're seeing a big decline in insects. And so I wanna convince people to do what's right for insects uh, for their own sake, um, but I do also lead into some stuff they may care about a little bit more. For me, the easiest way to do that is with this wonderful charismatic insect, the, the monarch, right? The monarch butterfly. If you don't like butterflies, you're probably at least not offended by having butterflies uh, coming to your garden. They're, they're beautiful, they're interesting. Uh, they're kind of fascinating with their migratory life cycle. And if you do follow uh, their life cycle, if you can convince someone to go out and watch a monarch go from an egg to a caterpillar, to a chrysalis, to a butterfly, um, that's something that actually a lot of people don't experience. And it's a whole new way to connect them to nature and to realize that this is really fascinating stuff. And so I start off with monarchs and milkweed. And it's not only a great way to show people that insects are important, but it sort of uh, it allows me to incorporate a little bit of science. So the vast majority of our insect species are, are, are very specific uh, eaters. About 90% of them live only on a few species of plants. So when it comes to uh, butterflies, it gives me the opportunity to demonstrate the difference between providing a flower that might feed a butterfly, which a lot of ornamental flowers may do, and providing a host plant, which will actually provide a place for that monarch to, to, to complete its life cycle. So there's a big difference between those two things. And, and one of the struggles that I have is convincing people that just because a plant attracts a butterfly doesn't mean it's ecologically valuable. It doesn't mean it's habitat. We want something that is actually going to support them throughout their life cycle. And the monarch and the milkweed is just a really familiar example of that. Um, it is a little bit more difficult for me to convince people that having a plant that has no leaves left on it by the end of summer is beautiful in its own unique sort of way, right? It, you're providing something where life can, 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 can take foot and can, and can go through its whole life cycle. That's its own kind of beauty. It's not necessarily about uh, just having big green plants and flowers all over them. So it's not super hard to get people to, uh, to like plants, getting them to like insects and what insects sometimes do to our plants, convincing them you don't wanna spray everything that's swarming around on your, on your uh, flowers necessarily. Uh, that's a little bit harder, but like I said, one of the things that people come to me most for, 
I would say is for birds. Almost everybody who contacts our office, who comes up to me with questions about uh, creating habitat at their house, wants to know what they can do to attract more songbirds uh, to their gardens. And so insects are kind of my, I sandwich the insects, the things that people don't really like as much between native plants and birds to get, try to get them a little bit more appreciation. Uh, but I like to use the Carolina chickadee as my example of why we need more insects and why we need more native plants. Um, because it's, it's, I think it's a, a bird that nobody's really surprised by. It's a small bird, um, but it comes with some pretty astonishing numbers. And I use, uh, Dr. Doug Tallamy did some great research on uh, the Carolina chickadee in specific. And so when people say they want to attract more birds to their garden, or they want to create this habitat, they're usually talking about putting out a bird feeder and providing seed year round. So I use the Carolina chickadee as my example of why we need more than just seed, why that's not really creating habitat. Um, that might be a supplement, but that's not habitat. So 96% of our terrestrial birds raise their young on insects, largely soft bodied insects like uh, the caterpillar that chickadee's got in its mouth. Um, they, they're not looking for seeds in the spring because they don't naturally exist. They're looking for those insects. And so the Carolina chickadee is a pretty typical bird. It takes about 16 to 18 days for a nest of Carolina chickadees to fledge, to go from hatching out to being able to fly on their own. That's a handful of chicks, maybe three to five chicks. And in that 16 to 18 days, the, the pair of Carolina chickadees re rearing that nest have to bring back somewhere between six and 9,000 caterpillars to feed that nest. That's a pretty challenging number. You can do the math on how many they have to gather every hour to feed that nest. But if you imagine going out in your backyard and finding several thousand caterpillars over the course of a little bit less than three weeks, um, that, that's an almost impossible, insurmountable task. That's not something that any of us could, could probably do. And for the large part of that is because we just don't have that many insects on our plants. And native plants are the solution to that. So when people go out in their garden and they don't see stuff on their calorie pair, uh, they don't see caterpillars all over it. I go into another piece of Doug Tallamy's research where he talks about the actual value of native plants when it comes to supporting things like our bird populations uh, and why those insects are again so important. So we, he looked at the calorie pear and he found that a calorie pear tree can host a handful of Lepidoptera, which is moths and butterflies in their caterpillar form. So you're getting a few species of, of, of caterpillars that are on that plant, whereas native oak species can host about 530 different Lepidopter species. Uh, so that's, uh, that's orders of magnitude more insects on these native plants. So the first step to getting people to, if, if, if what you really want is to attract more songbirds, the first step is planting those native plant species because they host more uh, insects. And then the second step is sort of appreciating the value that those insects have uh, in our ecosystem. So it's not just an argument for uh, planting native plants. It also means we need to have uh, more native plants. So just incorporating a couple into an ornamental garden is great, but if you can convert a larger part of your uh, land to, to something that supports native uh, species, you're going to see more variety of species up that, uh, up that ladder, uh, especially those songbird species that almost everybody in these neighborhoods wants to see. So I always tell everybody who comes to my presentations that if they want to fall asleep or leave or ignore everything else I say, I just want them to remember one phrase, biodiversity is key. We know that when it comes to larger uh, ecological settings, but it's also really important when it comes to just the smaller gardens uh, that we're building at home. So we want people to incorporate. So a lot of people that I talk to, for instance, um, they might have room for a garden with uh, 50 native plants. Uh, it's not a huge space but they want to provide nothing but milkweed because they love the monarch butterfly for some. They just, all they want to do is support the monarch butterfly. So they want to plant 50 milkweed plants. And that's where I have to convince them that, you know, it's, it's really better to have um, maybe five, five each of 10 different species um, than to have a garden that's just uh, milkweed. Even if you're trying to support the monarch butterfly, even if that's your big goal is that you want to provide habitat for the monarch, you're still better off having that biodiversity because you're, if you have a wider variety of native plants, you'll have a wider variety of insects, you'll have a wider variety of birds out from there, uh, and you'll just end up with a, a more sound ecosystem. So even in those small neighborhood settings, I want people to remember that biodiversity is key.
I also am on a little bit of a crusade uh, against lawns. And I know that's weird coming from somebody who lives in an HOA, but uh, I, I really despise lawns. Uh, and not just that they're not habitat, but that they often, um, the way we maintain them, the way we look after them, um, the impacts they have on our environment detract uh, from habitat, certainly natural habitat. And so uh, this is easily the hardest part of the, the workshop that I have to give. Nobody ever comes to me, nobody ever calls Indiana Wildlife Federation and says, um, how do I get rid of lawns? Nobody is ever looking to do that because we have this attachment uh, to our lawns. So I, I have this picture of, I call this house the Greenwood Dream, Greenwood Dream Home. It was probably built on uh, old farmland. It's a uh, very flat, huge expansive lawn that uh, is uh, conspicuously free of weeds. So I'm sure that there's plenty of chemicals going on to it. I'm assuming that's a calorie pair out front. Uh, those are all manicured hedges. It looks great and it probably has high property value, um, but that is not a habitat and plopping a bird feeder down in the middle of that lawn is not creating uh, space for birds really. So the other picture up here on the left is a picture of one of our uh, uh, old board members uh, converted house. So he used to live in a house that looked like the one on the right, but his hobby after he retired was bird watching. So he would sit in this big, he had a big dining room with a, a corner, 90 degree angle corner window. And he would look out on his fields and he would sit there in the morning with his coffee and his uh, binoculars and he would just bird watch. And that was his thing. And he came to us and he said, what, what am I doing wrong? I'm, I'm only getting, you know, this handful of birds. I want to see new stuff. I want to see more exciting stuff that I, I see when I go out into uh, nature. And so we convinced him that he needed to have more native habitat, that that's how you're going to attract higher quality birds. You're not going to see something like a cedar waxwing if you have a bird feeder in the middle of a lawn. It's just not going to show up. And so he did this really great job of converting. This was a lawn space. This, uh, all these native plants, was, it was just mowed grass. And he did a great, great job of converting it into a garden that not just not only provides for wildlife, um, but also looks pretty appealing. Now, I don't think I could get away with that in my HOA necessarily. That might be a little bit too much. Maybe in my backyard where nobody can see it. I don't know. But this was my this was my big push was to get people to move away from maintaining their lawns and to start converting small pieces into these native habitats. And I'm going to go over some. I, I just have some landscaping tips that I give to people in these uh, circumstances to maybe reduce the risk that you're gonna get a letter if you live in an HOA like I do, um, because native plants can be a little bit unruly uh, based on what people are used to seeing. The great thing about convincing people to incorporate some natives is that we can kind of normalize seeing natives. I think for a lot of people who might uh, find them to be detracting, they just don't see it very often. They don't see native landscaping and they think it looks like weeds. So I, I just have a few landscaping tips that I give people in neighborhoods. One of them is to, I, I recommend people tier. They, they, they plant their, their plants in sort of a tiered structure with the, the taller plants in the middle. Obviously, if you have the tall plants on the outside, they can, they're prone to flopping over if they're not, if, you know, if they're not a particularly sturdy plant. Uh, but if you put them in a tier where they sort of uh, uh, transition up to the taller plants in the middle, uh, it lets people see the garden in a more aesthetically pleasing way that we're kind of used to. Tearing plants like that is a pretty typical ornamental style of gardening as well. I also, I don't just recommend, I, 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 I vehemently ask people to please use structure plant, plants like grasses. I know that grasses aren't a sexy plant for people who want to build a native garden. They want stuff that flowers, but we need plants that have uh, a supporting um, role in our ecosystems and grasses are really important. They prevent a lot of our native plants from flopping. Uh, they provide habitat and, and, and food as well, even though they don't necessarily have the big showy flowers. Uh, and going back to the monarch butterfly, uh, if you just have milkweed, believe it or not, monarchs don't like to go into chrysalis form on a milkweed. They try to find another plant to do that on. And I often find them on my grasses. They'll go into the grasses because they provide more of a, a defensive structure, or they provide a better, better place to hide. I constantly see my rabbits hiding under the grass because we have a lot of rabbits and a lot of hawks out here. So they provide their own role as well. Um, I also recommend to people, if you have a uh, public facing garden, consider using uh, grasses, shorter stature grasses. Like I have a little blue stem that I actually just keep uh, right here. Um, it's a great short stature grass that you can put as a border around the outside of a garden so that you're essentially 
Uh, it's sort of like a velvet rope around the garden, right? You're telling people this is all intentional. I mean for this to be here. Uh, it, it's bordered off. It's, it, it is an actual garden. It's not just a bunch of weeds growing up. Uh, for some reason, this idea that these grasses contain this garden makes it a little bit more acceptable for people who aren't used to seeing um, native gardenings. Another great thing to do, not just for ecology, but for uh, people who are going to be walking by and looking at the garden, is to incorporate year-round blooming. So it's, it's really offensive to some people if you have a garden that doesn't have any plants that bloom past, say, late summer, and you have this sort of dead green or brown garden in the fall. Uh, people don't like to see that, but suddenly if you have an aster or a goldenrod or something that's blooming in the fall, uh, that's more appealing. So if you have plants that bloom year round, not only is that a great nectar source in the fall, but for humans looking at it, when they see things flowering, it's more appealing than what appears to be a dead, uh, even though it may not be ecologically uh, dormant, it, it looks dormant to them. And so they sometimes put off by that. I also recommend signage. For a couple reasons, obviously, we use signage as a fundraiser. So, of course, I want people to have a sign in their front yard. But also because, again, it demonstrates intent. And if you have a neighbor who sees your signage, uh, they may ask you about it. They may ask you, what is a native garden? What, what, are, you, what are you doing here that's, that's important? And it can be a conversation starter. And uh, having conversation with neighbors is often a great way to, um, you know, talk about what they might normally just uh, report and ignore right so we want people to talk about their native gardens not just uh not just put them out there and hope for the best uh we also have i also recommend to people uh if you're replacing a plant uh, you can go native without veering too far off from the uh, let's uh, call it the general aesthetic of the neighborhood so in my neighborhood, when we built it, we had two different kinds of plants, uh, trees that you could plant. Uh, there's some sort of uh, ornamental um, dwarf maple of some kind, and then there's a calorie pear. And one of the rules in our HOA is if you lose one of those trees, you have to replace it with a similar tree. So they want you, if your calorie pear dies, which our neighborhood is coming up on 20 years old, so a lot of these calorie pears are splitting apart and dying. They want you to replace it with something that looks similar because it fits this general homogenized uh, uh, aesthetic for the entire neighborhood. So they don't want me to put uh, some tree out in front of my yard that's going to throw all that off. So I recommend people use uh, a native replacement that is similar in size, shape, color, bloom time, all that. So if you're replacing the calorie pear, you can use something like a service berry. It's gonna be pretty similar, but it's a, mu it's a much better uh, tree than replacing that calorie pair with another calorie pair. It's gonna look fairly similar. Uh, so, so finding natives that will substitute for those ornamentals is another uh, good option. And then short stature plants are probably one of the biggest questions I get about uh, planting a native garden in an HOA. I live on a corner and underneath one of my trees, uh, you have to have a sight line because there's a stop sign. And so I can't have switch grasses and, and and, and blue false indigo sort of blocking that sight line. I need short stature plants. And so I have some smaller, you know, golden Alexanders and things underneath my trees that won't uh, necessarily block people's view. So sometimes using shorter stature plants can um, get people not to look at, at, at your garden quite as askance as they, they might if you had big, tall, uh, if you had Joe Pye or something that was sort of uh, obvious. So the next thing that I go over with everybody, this is sort of the end of the presentation that I usually give, is um, what we have termed the four needs of wildlife. So if you want to um, certify your garden through IWF and NWF's program, you have to meet the criteria for the four needs of wildlife. And we have, the first one up is uh, food. Some of this stuff is pretty obvious, but some of it isn't. Uh, I like to, to remind people that Again, I go back through all the points I already made. Insects have a species-specific diet. They have very specific needs. You want to attract as many as possible. So you need biodiversity. And even if you don't like insects on their own, they're an important food source uh, for other wildlife like the songbirds that almost everybody's uh, looking to attract. And then I like to run through the different kinds of uh, food sources that people can provide. Um, nuts, berries, leaves, obviously, for insects. Uh, and I usually put artificial at the bottom because it isn't always possible for us to provide uh, food 
in our gardens year round or in a specific way, sometimes we like to supplement those, but we have to make sure we're doing it properly. That's why I put it at the bottom because you can do it, but it takes a lot more work. You really need to make sure you're doing it properly. You don't want dirty bird feeders. Um, you you want to make sure that you're not creating a, a zone for transmission of disease. Uh, so you have to keep them clean. Um, you, you could be just providing food for invasives too. If you have a bird feeder out that's just feeding a bunch of invasive uh, sparrows or something, uh, that's not necessarily as good as providing insects for maybe maybe you're trying to attract bluebirds. Almost I don't know why everybody seems to want a bluebird nesting in their uh, their neighborhood these days. They're beautiful, but uh, you have to make sure that you're providing actual habitat for those. Let's call them more shy species that are not going to be as aggressive as the ones that do well at bird feeders. So I, I leave artificial on there, but I do like to put it uh, sort of at the end. Water is a pretty obvious one. Every 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 living thing needs water. Um, I remind people that all sizes of water matter. It's it, not everybody's going to be able to build a wetland in the back of their uh, property, but even if you can just have something like a, a bird a bird bath, that's still a, a really good water source as long as you're doing it properly. So I give some people some examples. You can provide butterfly dishes and bird baths. Even water features can can function uh, as a water source. Uh, and the question that I invariably get when I recommend to people to have standing water on their property, because obviously not all of us can create flowing water, is what does that mean for mosquitoes? So my, my, my talking point is usually that uh, mosquitoes don't typically come from high quality water sources. They come from water sources you don't mean to provide. So, you know, if you have an upturned bucket somewhere in your backyard, if there's a tire in the woods that's on its side and it's collected a few inches of water, only mosquitoes can survive in that. And they're going to do really well in that low quality water source. If you have a, a bird bath that you're cleaning out once a week or more, you're not going to have a mosquito problem. You're going to interrupt that life cycle. Um, and if you keep it cleaned out, you're going to have a nice clean source of water. Uh, for your birds. I also put some rocks in my bird feeder or my bird bath um, partially because it it keeps it from being tipped over by uh, nosy squirrels and things like that but also because it allows insects to land on those rocks if the rocks stick out a little bit from the water. Uh, it creates a shallow source of water for for different kinds of birds who may not want to get into several inches of water. Uh, so you know as long as you're keeping keeping it clean again with artificial sources you're gonna have uh, a good source of water for wildlife. The next thing we talk about is shelter. I break this down into two different kinds of shelter for people. I define them as uh, thermal shelter and escape cover. So a thermal shelter is basically, do you have a place where wildlife can go? And it, thermal is kind of misleading um, when, when conditions are bad. So when it's raining really hard, do you have a tree where birds can get out of the, the rain? Uh, do you have a place where hot wildlife in the summer can get and find some shade? They're not necessarily going to live there, uh, but it's a place they can go to just get out of the elements. And then escape cover is where can they go if uh, things are about to get real bad for their day, right? I, like I said, I have a lot of rabbits and a lot of hawks in our neighborhood. And uh, my big switchgrass is constant. There's constantly a rabbit hiding under my switchgrass when I see, a, you know, the shadow of a hawk uh, flying around overhead. Uh, they're not going to live there underneath my switchgrass, but they're definitely going to take shelter there until uh, danger passes. And there are a lot of different ways to provide this shelter. Um, you can do some of these, I guess, cross over between artificial and natural. You can have brush piles, uh, which, you know, again, I have to warn people, depending on where you are, um, you may end up with things like snakes. That's an entirely different topic, but, but that's habitat as well. Um, tree snags are a little more difficult. Maybe if you have more room, a bigger property, you can leave a dead tree standing um, sort of away from anything it might harm. Uh, shrubs, rocks, wood cords. And then one that I, that I have been going to a lot more recently is uh, leaf, leaf litter. And there have been a lot of campaigns about leave the leaves and things like that. I encourage people to uh, leave their leaves where they are, partially because I'm lazy and I really don't want to do any more yard work than I have to but also going through the reasons why that leaf litter can provide overwintering grounds for some insects, uh, why those leaves as they decay provide, um, you know, certain benefits to the soil and thus the native plants that are growing there. Uh, and if, if you don't have any other options, instead of mulching them or bagging them, um, you can rake them up and put them, 
where you would normally put mulch, they will break down and become sort of a mulch. That's all mulch is, is dead plant material. So you can leave them in place uh, where you would normally put a mulch over your native garden beds when they're dormant is a great idea. Just leave them in place. And then artificial stuff as well. If you're clumsy like me, this is just a little uh, couple inch terracotta pot that I broke. Uh, we painted it up to say toad abode and sometimes you'll find if you put it in the right uh, location, you might find a, a little toad or something. Uh, hanging out underneath there every once in a while. And then last but not least is nesting space. This is obviously pretty important. Um, you have to have a place for wildlife to uh, raise their young. Again, this is not always the easiest thing in a neighborhood. You might, you probably aren't going to have, uh, uh, if you live in an HOA like mine with younger short stature trees, you're probably not going to have a raccoon population, but you might have squirrels. Uh, so there, there, there are different ways to provide uh, this nesting opportunity. We talk about nesting locations. Um, sometimes providing just the materials is, is, is fine. Uh, I didn't plant my trees, but I do uh, chop back my switchgrass, for instance, in the spring, usually around St. Patrick's Day, I'll chop back my native plants and I'll see birds coming around and picking up pieces of that grass to build their nests out of. Um, we also want to make sure we're telling people to provide natural uh, sources of nesting material. Don't leave yarn and pet hair and things like that outside, but just Chop down your native plants, leave them in place, and you've got great nesting material for birds. And then security. We have a lot of uh, issues with cats, feral cats, for instance, in neighborhoods, or sometimes just house cats that people let wander around. If you have a, a birdhouse in a yard where a feral cat might frequent, you don't necessarily have a nesting location as much as a cat buffet, right? So it, it's about providing security as well. And then there's different ways to provide these uh, mature trees and tree snags are, are sometimes kind of tough in neighborhoods, but plant stems, for instance, a lot of people don't realize that our solitary bees don't create big hives with other bees. They're solitary. They live on their own and they will bore holes in the side of some of our hollow reedy plants and put a larva in there and cap it off. And that's where the bees will grow up. And so that's why we recommend in the fall, you wait till around St. or in the spring, you wait till around St. Patrick's Day. Uh, before you cut back your natives because there are animals potentially going through their life cycle within the hollow stems of those plants. Leaf litter again is another uh, option and then artificial. So I have a picture of bug hotel up there. That bug hotel is mimicking what we get when we leave our hollow uh, native plant stems up until the spring. We didn't come up with this idea out of nowhere. This is mimicking that it's providing a nest for solitary insects to, to, to lay their young uh, similar to what they would find if you just leave your native plants up. So you don't need this artificial source if you're able to provide the native source. You may not be able to look at it. I know that these are kind of fun to go examine, um, but you will still be providing that, that resource for wildlife uh, naturally so long as you have those native plants. And then sometimes artificial is somewhat necessary. If you want to attract bats or more likely you're going to get a flying squirrel, sometimes you have to put up a bat house. Not all of us have shag bark hickories and abandoned silos and caves and stuff in our in our yards. So sometimes an artificial uh, option is uh, the one that's uh, most available. And then, like I said, we also have, I recommend signage uh, when you're doing any kind of native, ha native habitat work simply because people aren't familiar with it. So these are examples of the signs that uh, NWF offers and that we offer. And I wanted to finish up by uh, saying that we have we expected it to be online um, before today, but I think we're going, we're, do, we're doing sort of an under construction test version of it today. And then we're hoping to go live on Monday. Uh, we're developing our website. It's being redeveloped. The whole thing's being redone. And one of the opportunities that I have with the redevelopment of our website was to create a, a go-to uh, native uh, gardening resource that would cover everything from the planning phase to the planting phase to the maintenance phase. Uh, and we were planning on doing that in a, not just with uh, sort of a text breakdown, but we were making an educational series of videos. Unfortunately, the COVID pandemic put the kibosh on that. I'm hoping that if things go well, we can start that up again this summer. Um, so we, like I said, we plan on having it all finished by now, but maybe over the course of the next year or so, we're going to be de developing a video series on where to get native plants, what they look like when you get them, how to plant them properly, how to select the location for them, uh, how to care for them, what they're going to look like in the long run. And I'm hoping that's going to be a really good uh, native plant resource for anybody who has any questions. I'm going to try to answer every single question I can um, with that website. 
We've also developed a really in-depth um, native plant finder for people who aren't sure what native plant they want. They'll be able to break it down by size, uh, bloom time, color, what kind of wildlife it provides for. If you've ever been in the Missouri Botanical Garden plant finder, it's an Indiana specific, um, much more user-friendly sort of version of that. Um, it's going to be a little bit less detail. We're trying to make this for sort of entry level um, people getting into native plants. Um, but I'm hoping that's going to be a really good resource that we'll have online here uh, this month that you are welcome to send anybody to. And of course, if you ever get anybody with any native plant questions, uh, you're welcome to direct them to me. I think if you don't have my email, I'm happy to give it to everybody. Um, just send them my way. I, I love to answer all those different questions about how people can get started. And unless there are any questions, that is, uh, that's all I have for you today. So let's see here. First question would, do you have any recommended ratio of host plants to nectar plants? But yeah, I don't know that I've taken the time to differentiate the two. Um, usually we list, we don't usually break down uh, plants as nectar plants because so many host plants can be nectar plants. But uh, I would love to hear if anybody has an opinion, I haven't actually thought about that, the difference between uh, the, the ratio of nectar plants and, and host plants. We break it down. The only ratio I give for people is uh, grasses versus um, forbs, which I usually give people like a 30% grasses mix uh, for their planting. Oh, you mean specifically for monarchs? I am reading the chat now. I can see it now. Okay. Um, the first question actually, didn't say monarchs, but yeah. So yeah, th no, this is great. I don't, I don't break it down um, quite that way. What I usually tell people is that you obviously need everything except tropical milkweed. Always, always discourage tropical milkweed. You, you need different kinds of milkweed. And I'll give people advice on what milkweed is the best host plant. Unfortunately, common milkweed seems to be a really good host plant, but it's not a great neighborhood plant. So my compromise is usually swamp milkweed. I think it does really well as a host plant. Um, but then I don't give a ratio on nectar plants, but I always, always, always go with the caveat that you need to have fall nectar plants because monarchs are migrating species. They're leaving our state in September through October, usually middle of September is when they're at their peak. If you don't have nectar flowers in the fall or in that really late summer, when a lot of milkweed is already go starting to go to seed, um, you're not really providing, again, uh, a habitat for monarchs. You have to have that fall blooming plant as well. So I don't have a ratio, but I always say have fall nectar sources available. And I know that people demonize goldenrod. It doesn't cause allergies. I try to shoot that one down as quick as I can. Uh, goldenrods and asters and things like that are fantastic uh, fall nectar plants. If I can... Um... Also step in here a little bit, Aaron, to add on to that. If you are looking for some more information about the, the nectar plants to ratio, um, specifically for the USDA programs, and this is this relates to seed, but could be translated to plants as well. We do require that one and a half percent of a mix be the milkweeds, and then 60% of the mix be nectaring plants. So in that Again, like you said, Aaron, covering those times that they'll be in flight. So that's just a general rule of thumb. It was an agreement USDA came up with with US Fish and Wildlife Service as we do monarch conservation. I don't know that it's necessarily, um, you know, a rule of thumb, but it, it's just a, a ratio that is out there. That's great. And there is a list of those plants known to be very supportive of monarch in um, the USDA Monarch guides, particularly for the Midwest. So you can get that list that are, that are specifically known to be plants visited by monarchs. But I, I would agree with, when you're talking about general species, Aaron, I completely agree. There's not really a good ratio of nectar to, to host because like you said, it could be a host, it could be a nectaring plant, depends yeah. on what species you're talking about. There's a lot of crossover. That's why I kind of just leave with biodiversity. The Absolutely. more biodiversity you can get, the better. There's lots of information in the chat. If you haven't looked, everyone's sharing their resources, which is fantastic. Um, if I can just comment on something, I see John Hazlitt said this already. He's recommending the Native Plant Society Landscaping Guide. So the resource that I mentioned that we're putting together for our website, the uh, video series, we are making in partnership with the Native uh, Indiana Native Plant Society. So they are going to be helping us. Uh, they have some actual landscapers, which I'm not. I, I'm an environmental scientist person. I'm not a landscaper. So we're all kind of partnering to come up with this resource that not only prioritizes natives and habitat, but is also developed by people who landscape with these plants. Uh, so it'll be a much more comprehensive uh, 
resource for people. And they've also helped us with data uh, for our, uh, our plant finder. It's not me that put it together. It's data that was put together with, uh, co in cooperation with the Purdue Extension. So it's, it's uh, really, really sound uh, data on what species these support, their sizes, their shapes, their bloom times, all that. It's really good uh, scientifically supported information. It's not just me throwing things out there. One last question in here. A lot of everything else is, again, resources, so please everyone check out the chat. But Aaron, do you, have you heard of or do you have any comments on the Homegrown National Park? Yeah, that's uh, Doug Tallamy's big uh, push. Um, that's more of, I would say, more of something that NPAWS uh, is working with, but I, I certainly think that it's a, a fantastic idea. I, I mean, I, I, you're not going to find me disagreeing with a whole lot that Doug Tallamy says. But uh, one of the things that I like to uh, use in my workshop that I tell people is that we have to get rid of this concept of nature as being a place you go to and nature as being something that's all around you. So nature is right, and it can be right in your backyard. You don't have to pack up the car and drive to your local park to experience nature. You can experience in a 100 square foot garden in your backyard. And so that, that's sort of what my big takeaway from this uh, homegrown national park thing is that uh, we have to start viewing nature as something that we are in all the time and stop thinking of our neighborhoods as being these sterilized places where we have bright green lawns and, and things like that. I'm going to pass the mic over to Jessica and Aaron of the IDNR to start on those hurdles and pitfalls section because I know this is a lot of the questions we get as well. So, Hi, I'm Jessica Merkling and I'm the North Region Urban Wildlife Biologist and I will let Aaron introduce herself. Hi, I'm Erin Bassiger. I'm the South Region Urban Wildlife Biologist. Um, today we're going to talk to you guys about some of the urban habitat building hurdles and pitfalls that we've experienced. Um, I'm guessing there's going to be a lot of really great overlap between the other presentations. And with that, I guess we'll get started. Um, this is kind of just a quick outline so you see what we're going to be discussing today. Um, we're just going to give you a quick overview of the Urban Wildlife Program, to talk about the local ordinances, uh, working with communities, and some other considerations. And it looks like we'll go even more into the mowing and landscaping portion of things. So with that, I'll get started on the Urban Wildlife Program. Um, the reason that I want to highlight this topic is because we have to think about why creating backyard habitat is important to begin with. And when I say backyard habitat, obviously we think about private landowners, but I also try to think about HOAs, maybe uh, industrial parks, those types of things. But essentially from our standpoint as urban biologists, you have urbanization as being this phenomenon by which uh, central towns and cities are starting to expand and becoming larger and larger. And as those spaces start changing, you create, you change the habitat around there and that create change, creates changes in the wildlife that uses those habitats and you may have an increase of human wildlife interactions and those interactions can be both positive and negative. And there's also this idea that um, was already touched upon about how a lot of people think like conservation happens somewhere out there. It's like this magical place where, well, they're doing conservation elsewhere. But the reality is, is that our, as our areas start expanding, our out there is actually getting closer and closer to here. And there's been a couple studies done, but the projections are that 70% of people in the world will live in some type of an urban area by the year 2050. And then as of 2018, it was estimated that another 60% of the land that was going to become urban has yet to be built. And it's supposed to be built by 2030. So it's going to be rapid changes. And in Indian alone, we have 897 species of fish and wildlife, and we need to start thinking about ways to create habitat, habitat to maintain all of them. Um, and to kind of help drive that point home, uh, this is a map showing changes in Fort Wayne. Uh, yes, it's Fort Wayne because it's one of my areas. However, I've drawn maps like this for almost all urban areas in the state, and I'm sure you guys could all do this pretty easily on your own. But this is a... Uh, an image of about 12 square miles in Fort Wayne. Um, you can see that it's technically kind of urban in 1998. You have the little um, HOAs and stuff on the right-hand side there. But if you fast forward 10 years, it already looks vastly different. So if you can't really tell, within all the red circles, those are just in 10 years, all the new developments that happened. 
If you fast forward another 10 years, um, these were the first 10 years of changes, and here are the second 10 years of changes. So as you can see, the idea of urbanization is a real thing and growing in urban areas and trying to create space and um, habitat for wildlife. So I really think it's important to just touch on that as we talk about why we're trying to convince people to put habitat in the ground and work with landowners. So in order to kind of address this, there's a lot of different states and Indiana was one of them where they created the urban, um, urban biologist programs or some sort of urban program. So currently in the state of Indiana, Indiana has two urban biologists, myself in the north and Aaron in the south. For my areas for habitat work, I predominantly cover Elk Elkhart, Fort Wayne, South Bend, and some of the surrounding cities. And Aaron covers um, Indianapolis and some of those surrounding cities. And then you can see up there, we have some of the counties that we do some wildlife work in, but um, you get the kind of idea of where we are. As part of the Urban Wildlife Program, we work under what we call um, our wildlife pillars. And the first pillar that we often talk about is wildlife conflict mitigation. For us, a lot of time that's answering phone calls, developing resources, providing guidance and techniques for living with wildlife. And sometimes a lot of those discussions are about changing the habitat, um, sometimes changing and adding to it, sometimes removing maybe a wood pile if there's a problem. It just kind of depends on the situation. Um, we also try to promote sustainable natural resource planning and development. This one kind of easily rolls into developing habitat, which I'll touch on on the next slide, but just things like prescribed fire, thinking about um, sustainability and green infrastructure in towns and cities as they start building their habitat. And then we arguably spend probably most of our time on trying to develop, improve, and acquire urban wildlife habitat. These are just some examples of projects that we've done. And as part of our program, we do have some cost share funding available to put habitat in the ground in our urban areas. So that may be something important for you guys to know if you ever have use for us in a resource. We do have other district biologists that may not be as well suited for the urban environment, but there's lots of different people we can put in contact and try and help landowners where, um, where they're where appropriate. And then finally, we do a lot of promoting conservation appreciation. So education and outreach, talking to people about habitat. We've done things at the state fair. So you kind of get the idea that we try to be involved in engaging and outreaching to people, at least to some capacity. And then wherever we want to, we really want to try and combine pillars. Um, this is a picture that you'll see later in the presentation. But for this one, the HOA really wanted to create pollinator habitat. But they also, if you look really close at the sidewalk, you can kind of see where they wanted to deal with some goose conflicts. And then in the far distance, it's really hard to see, but they were having some erosion problems on this property as well. So that was one example of combining different pillars and then creating habitat um, through conservation appreciation. So on the left-hand side there is actually in Elkhart County where we use a group of students where um, there's a plot of land that's divided into six half acre plots and ideally the students are responsible for seeding it. And as they go through middle school and high school, they will be able to make uh, changes and recommendations for maintaining those habitats. And then on the right hand side is actually at the office where I work out of when I'm not working remotely during COVID. This, um, where we worked with the local high school students to put um, native plugs in to replace the invasive burning bushes. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Erin. So next we're going to talk about some local ordinances. So this will go in a little bit of background and a little other information. Okay. So before um, converting any meadow, prairie, or pollinator habitat on your property, it is essential to check local ordinances first. Specifically, um, if a landowner comes in and is interested or um, a homeowner is interested, they need to check with the Vegetation Control Institute or weed or similar vegetation. If they talk to their local government or authority, I'm sure that they would be more than welcome to provide this, them information. This can result, not following these and being in violation can result in a citations um, and a summons. It could be a penalty and fine and under worst case scenario, potential jail, jail time if the fines aren't paid. So this essentially makes 
local ordinance violations in a worst case scenario, a criminal offense. And so we definitely do not want to do, uh, have a landowner do anything like this. And um, so talking to the local government or authority, there are some different things that, that they can get. One may be, uh, they may be able to get a waiver to be able to do what they want to do if it's putting in native habitat. Um, this could include like maybe putting up some sort of signs to educate neighbors or anybody who walks by and may think, oh, that does not look good. Um, and at the same time, talking to that local government and authority will also give them the ability to have something on record so that if someone does drive by and it's someone that, you know, doesn't know what's going on and go, oh, that looks awful. And then they call and complain. The local authority can say, hey, we have a plan on file. You know, this is getting turned into native habitat and it'll help with situations like that. Okay. So what are some examples of local ordinances? Um, so I looked up a few. So these are just kind of random ones throughout the area. And I just kind of snapshot the basic portions that you know kind of are specific to this presentation. And so uh, Noblesville has, they all have some really great information. And if you don't know, again, talk to your local ordinance or the landowner can. And so the first one, Noblesville, you can see there, they have a really neat one. Um, it was one of the few that had listed out what species or plants they considered rank and must be removed. And so each one is different um, to an extent in some way, shape or form. So as you can see with the Noblesville, um, they talk about grasses must be kept shorter than six inches and they talk about what you know ornamentals can be used. Um, and then you have South Bend and that one is the one with the half star. And so with that one, it's nine inches or taller. And then you have Evansville over here and they talk about, you know, no real property owner should allow any growth of grass or weeds in excess of nine inches. And they talk about the rank vegetation as well. And then for the last example, we have Griffith and any weed or rank vegetation that's growing absent of regular maintenance by the property owner and is growing higher than six inches high. And what we, Unfortunately, you know, native plants and stuff that we want to put in there or the landowner may want to put in there gets lumped in a lot of times with other plants that would not be as desirable like the list of rank species that Noblesville has there, okay? So what are some of the causes for this? So it, as you can see, you know, generally the belief is that uncontrolled vegetation results in a risk to public health and safety. And this is from the South Bend um, pamphlet that they had on it. And so you can see kind of the bullets that they provided, which is nice that they provide this because if you do have a plan um, and you wanna do something like this or the landowner has a plan and wants to do something like this, this is where generating a plan with someone in advance, they can take these into account they can approach the local authority and, and they can say, you know, it won't do this, it won't do that because of that. And they can help educate and prove why they won't be in violation. But as you can see, the first one is kind of important and we'll talk more about this later with the whole mowing versus landscaping. It's dangerous. Tall grasses and weeds can block the line of sight for motors and pedestrians. It encourages the presence of bugs like insects and insects like ticks and mosquitoes. It promotes home for pests like mice, moles, raccoons, and rodents. Tall weeds can aggravate allergies, provides cover for criminal activity. It collects trash and debris and aesthetics. So, I mean, I think with the previous presentation and what we're gonna learn later today too, a lot of this stuff uh, can be debunked essentially. And sometimes in terms of ordinances, are left undefined. So as you saw before in the previous slide, they don't say what species are considered rank. Um, and so in those situations, it's up to the code enforcement officer, who is the person who is likely to come out and take a look at your property if a complaint has been received, to come out and go, okay, as they're looking at your property, is this plant a weed? Are these plants useful? Are they edible? Are they ornamental? What's going on here? And ultimately they're the kind of the people that will make that decision, okay? So navigating through the laws, um, as I mentioned before, if you talk to your local authority, you may be able to get a waiver, um, especially if you can provide a plan. Um, in some instances, 
planting designs can help prevent violating local ordinances. Like I mentioned before, if you know what concerns they have, you can take those concerns into consideration and having a plan to show them can help out. You may be able to update local ordinances with enough support. So you can work with your neighbors, work with your community, you know, educate and update. Many communities draft local regulations and limit problematic vegetation while still allowing for natural landscapes. So a lot of um, communities or cities are starting to catch on that, you know, native landscapes helps energy conservation, reduce labor costs and environmental benefits. And so, like I mentioned before, kind of unique with the Noblesville is that they actually specified what species they considered rank. And this helps um, in a lot of different ways. You can go next slide. Okay, so this is the city of Cincinnati. And they, in 2011, updated their weed ordinances and called it greening Cincinnati's weed ordinance. And so they've acknowledged that um, the code formally defined noxious weeds as any and all grass weeds and wild plants over 10 inches, which unfortunately includes a lot of desirable plants. And so they revamped or redid their weed ordinance so that you know, people could put in or create a diverse yard with natural landscapes that benefits um, and isn't necessarily the vegetation that, that can include vegetation that they don't, I'm sorry, trying to <laughs> say it the right way, that includes vegetation that will not cause any violation of the ordinance. And they also talk about how manicured lawn uses a lot of fossil fuels to mow and often a lot of toxic chemicals to keep. So it's overall a benefit for both the city and the people, okay? So overall, kind of wrapping it all together for local ordinances, here's some BMPs if you have a landowner who comes in or homeowner who comes in and wants to do something in their yard, the first thing they need to do is to talk to their local authority and identify any local ordinances that may apply to their property. They can sit down and talk with them, come up with a game plan. They can talk to their neighbors and tell them about their plan too. Um, this can help educate them if they don't understand, you know, why would you want to do a natural yard? And they can tell them, you know, well, there's multiple benefits. You could also, um, as we, the previous um, presentation talked about learning plant ID, you know, how to plant these plants and maintenance. It's all a big learning curve. And so the more that you learn, the more that yeah, you'll have in your wheelhouse. And so if hiring a landscape professional to design and install your natural yard, be sure to reach the comp or research the company, you know, check out some of their previous um, work that they've done, see if you like it, you know, and shop around. And then secondly, when you get to the planting stage, you wanna make sure that you maintain a well-defined border around your natural landscape, even if that border surrounds the entire yard. And we'll have some examples of this later on as well. You want to trim vegetation where necessary to not interfere with pedestrian and automobile line of sight, which we discussed, you know, in the previous slide that that was one of the concerns. So we can work around that kind of stuff, like we mentioned, and keep up with regular maintenance. We definitely don't want, if you do have, you know, a species that would be considered on the ranked species list, come in and kind of take over. That's where you want to keep up with regular maintenance. And then remember, overall, you know, if your local ordinance is prohibitive, to work with your community, you know, to educate and work together to change the ordinance to be more accepting of natural yards. And that's something that, you know, you guys, everyone can do. Okay. All right, um, and now I'm gonna talk about working with private communities. Um, initially, we talked about just making this HOAs in general, but I think it's pretty applicable across the, the board for both private landowners, as well as HOAs, retirement communities, um, complexes, large hospital grounds, those types of things. So generally speaking, when I, Aaron and I are called, there's a couple of reasons that they're looking for habitat work. Um, being in our line of work, a lot of times they're looking for ways to mitigate Canada goose conflicts. Um, as I showed in the previous picture, a lot of times there's erosion controls or erosion issues, or they're looking to address clean water. And sometimes they're looking for uh, rain gardens, and bioswales and different types of things like that. So most of the time when they're contacting us, they're looking to solve a different problem than maybe putting habitat in the ground. 
every once in a while, I do actually have a couple landowners that really just want to create native habitat for wildlife and kind of lose the lawn and go more native. Uh, usually when that happens though, it's, it's often one champion that's willing to do a lot of the work and they are um, trying to exhaust every, ability, uh, every opportunity to try to educate uh, a board or an association or neighbors about why they should put um, native habitat in the ground. Um, additionally, when they talk about habitat, um, they, they really often want trees is what I'm finding in my area. It's, it's possibly different from, from Aaron, but a lot of times people just think trees are habitat, but as most of us on this call know, we know there are other forms of habitat. So tall grasses, native forbs, sedges, wetlands, you name it. So there's other ways to do it. Um, so just keep in mind when you're working with HOAs, sometimes you're talking to one person that's trying to convince the masses and sometimes the masses either are against it or they simply aren't invested one way or the other. So some common concerns that I've noticed and Aaron has noticed is that these topics can be extremely divisive and often there's extremes on both ends. One example are health and safety concerns um, and a lot of times the safety concerns are not necessarily as biologists and landscapers and those types of things. We know that they're often perceived safety concerns versus actual, but there are some real legitimate health and safety concerns that we do have to be mindful of addressing. This is one example. Um, on the left-hand side, this was a rain garden planted somewhere um, in Elkhart County. And then on the right hand side is actually just a private landowner in Allen County who's done a lot of phenomenal hard work to put habitat in the ground. But you can see here, um, I'm standing on the other side and I can clearly see both vehicles here. On this side though, you can kind of see my car right here, but what you cannot see is a big truck that's hidden behind this. And you can kind of see where the visual line of sight is a problem. There was a situation on a planting down in the Indianapolis area where they had vegetation near the parking lot and they did have an experience increased numbers of break-ins. So they actually went back and revised the species list for shorter stature species. So they were still able to keep the native component, component and address the safety issue of line of sight. Um, and it may sound really far out there, but I did do a, a site visit with a, a near a college and they were very concerned that tall grasses and tall flowers could create, situ uh, create places for opportunities for young men and women of college campuses to get taken advantage of um, or taken somewhere where they may not be seen that they're needing help based on whatever metric you want to put in there. So that is a very valid health and safety concern because ultimately, as much as we wanna promote wildlife, we still have to think about the safety of everyone else. Another concern um, often, uh, and I think it was already touched upon earlier about allergies and health, that type of thing. Most of the time our native plants have a uh, sticky pollen and nectar, which doesn't spread and create as much allergy issues as those species that are wind pollinated. So the studies that have shown that the allergy change is almost negligible when you put in um, native plants versus mown grass or whatever it may be. There's also a lot of wildlife concerns, which I will touch on a little bit more in a, a following slide, but people are often worried about being stung, um, attracting wildlife, those types of things. There's often um, visual and aesthetic concerns, and this is also extremely divisive. Most of the experiences that we've had, they're very worried about their view sheds of their ponds. So sometimes it does help to take pictures with you if you go to landers to say, hey, this can be done in a way to where you maintain the aspects that you're looking for, as well as providing habitat. Um, so these are uh, pictures at different times of the year. This top one's in the summer and the bottom one's in the fall. And there's different colors throughout. So that year round aesthetic value and thinking and planning out ahead of time, those are all things that we can do to help talk to landowners and, and about putting habitat in the ground, that there is a way to do it to make it pretty and to make everybody happy. And then another common concern is that people are very limited in their time and their resources. Um, people don't like to look at things like prep sites for very long. And if you think about 
especially in an HOA situation, a lot of times they have ground crews taking care of some things. So sometimes it's one uh, supervisor or groundskeeper that is trying to do all the work and they have to realistically get it done in a certain amount of time with a certain amount of resources available to them. And if they're hiring people to mow and things like that, so if you put in a whole bunch of trees and that person has to hire some or help that may not be knowledgeable on how to maintain trees or do, may not care how to maintain the proper height for mowing for native vegetation, those are all things that we have to consider. Um, and again, this is that have to, at the office where we had to rip out them. We actually had to repair a tile, but then I convinced them to rip out all the burning bush. And so we use plugs as a way to address that time component. <clears throat> there are some tips that we found for helping communities succeed. One of those is community buy-in. This is going back to that um, Elkhart County water, rain garden where they actually had volunteers come out and uh, put the plugs in. If you have people that are actively working on and putting in the habitat, well, if it gets ruined, that's their hard work as well, and they care about it too. So usually you can get more advocacy that way. <coughs> uh, financial resources can be extremely hard in urban areas, especially for those really small plots of land. Um, I think that I'm starting to see more resources available, but it's still pretty difficult. Um, we have the Habitat cost share program for appropriate projects. There's a lot of local programs. I know up in the Fort Wayne area, Little River Wetlands Project very often collects seed and does a native plant giveaway. Um, we have the Seed a Legacy program, which you still need two acres to do that one, but it, it's a year round application where they send out Indian and native seed to people that are willing to put habitat in the ground. Um, I think Project Wingspan was doing one with the monarch wings across the Eastern Broadleaf Forest. I think that's actually starting to wrap up now, but there's different projects like that that pop up from time to time. So those are good resources. Um, accessibility is another big topic and really important topic right now. If people can't access and enjoy the habitat, then they're probably still not going to care as much. So if you can maintain moaned walkways here and there, um, maybe sidewalks, those types of things, and I know most of us here don't want to see all turf grass all the time, but it does have its place in some areas. So if we think about where it's being utilized, where it's not, and then how to get people to utilize that space, that can help with the idea that it's just wasted going to weeds, essentially. And then as we're all aware, there's a really big educational component that's just going to take a lot of time because it is a slow moving ship that we really have to educate people about the benefits of planting native. <clears throat> Another topic that I like to talk about briefly, because it sounds like we're going to probably reiterate this a couple times, um, helping those community members see that there is an end goal in mind. So indicating that the habitat is being maintained. We talked about educational signage, paths and walkways, and educating others. Um, so Bridgefield Nature Park talked about their native habitat and do not spray. This was at a, um, a, a school in Muncie where they should put their own spin to that this is their outdoor community classroom. So those are things to think about. Um, don't plant aggressive, aggressive species in manicured areas. So think about maybe if you're planting some type of tree, think about the litter that maybe your neighbor will have to deal with, some of the mass that may be problematic to them. Think about, um, that we talked about this as well, some of those tall native plants fall over and if they're falling over a sidewalk, that's obviously not desirable. Thinking of planting for all seasons to keep create that year-round aesthetic. And we talked about color grouping and it was talked about how you tier those plants at different times or at different heights so that way it looks a little less messy. And then incorporating flair. So this was a project in an urban area down in Indianapolis where there is um, resources provided to put habitat in the ground and then they worked with a local artist to put um, these different sculptures next to the educational signage. So it was another way to help draw attention to the area while incorporating community buy-in from locals. Um, unfortunately, these were in the news because I think people stole a couple of them. I haven't heard if they got brought back, but that's something else to think about. Um, and the other thing is helping members identify success. Um, as you're all aware, um, and especially for me, plants don't keep their flowers all year round and it takes a long time to really develop and nurture that skill. 
So really teaching them to be patient that especially if we're planting from seed, it takes some time for those native plants to establish, um, usually two to three years. There's always going to probably be some type of weed. Um, and there are landowners that have the time and availability to go and pull out every single invasive thing that they don't want or non unwanted plant, even if it's not necessarily invasive. But keep in mind that some of our native weeds, even considered weeds for our native plantings, are beneficial for wildlife to some degree. And um, it takes me because this is actually one of our native thistles that we would want. So there is some skill and time in developing that. If they have the ability to drill their seed when they're putting it in the ground, look for plants that grow in rows. That can be very helpful. And how, how to identify some of the species that grow more quickly. So things like partridge pea, black-eyed Susans. And then especially in urban areas, uh, watching for those invasive species, because that can be really easily spread in an urban area. Um, those developed areas are disturbed sites, which are more easily invaded by invasive species. Um, along the riverways, think about how those invasive seeds and things are being spread. And then obviously with ornamental things, uh, people like to plant a lot of things that maybe are not so healthy for the environment. So keeping an eye on those things. Um, there's some other general considerations that I just wanted to touch upon before Erin um, wraps it up with her section. Um, and this may help to talk to people as well. So this is an Indiana land use map and you can see the broken down um, different types. But Indiana is arguably probably one of the most altered states physically and then 97% of that habitat is, of that land is privately owned. So we really need to start working with private landowners to talk to them about why this is such an important, important component of conservation. And as we all know that um, there is a place for agriculture, there is a place for lands, but if you think about corn and soybeans or even turf grass, those are large standing monocultures, which is not um, embracing biodiversity as was already mentioned in the previous presentation. So anywhere we can really put that forth is a really good idea. Um, it was also already talked about a little bit about potential wildlife interactions. Uh, for Aaron and I, dealing a lot with living with wildlife, this is a very common concern we have. So when I talk about wildlife, I'm referring to non-domesticated native vertebrates and pollinators. Um, but when planting habitat, you are likely to attract those things that people want to see in their backyards. So pollinators, the bees, the butterflies, some of our songbirds, uh, occasionally some raptors, but people probably more often want to see those songbirds. There are some ongoing studies about the benefits to herps, but we've seen some research that says that um, as was already mentioned again, those milkweeds and pollinator plants are really important for the stopover for the migrating monarchs. It's also really important for the migrating songbirds and things like that. Um, and while this is important and people want to see those things, uh, it's hard to tell wildlife this is good habitat. We only want X, Y, and Z here, not you guys. So there are human adapters that do live on the periphery. Um, that necess don't necessarily have a direct benefit from uh, living so close to people, but it doesn't hurt either. So things like coyotes, deer, foxes. So there is still the risk of that. However, I would argue that most HOAs that I've worked in, there is a woodlot or something of that nature nearby. So they're already going to have a wildlife component there. So putting in native habitat is likely not going to change it that drastically. And you're still not likely to have those wildlife avoiders, so those big mammals that we really don't have breeding populations of in Indiana anyway, but we really don't have those, those big animals that aren't likely to be attracted to urban areas anyway. Another big thing is land ownership. I really like to start often on the GIS websites for the different counties um, because most of the time in urban areas, there's, there's a lot of confusion about who owns which property where and rights of ways. And I didn't realize until very recently that for the right-of-ways in the United States, there's 9 million acres in power line right-of-ways, 12 million acres in pipeline right-of-ways, and 17 million acres in roadside um, right-of-ways. So even though if they never know about you put the habitat, maybe no one says anything, but I have had landowners tell me that they planted along a right-of-way, someone got upset or mad based on whatever regulation for the right-of-way was, and they came in and ripped out everyone's hard work. So I think it's really important to think about where you can and cannot plant if you own the property. Um, 
And if there's requirements, maybe there's a compromise where you talk about what their requirements are. So um, I've heard people talking back and forth to do maybe short, stand, short stature plantings without trees and shrubs, and they were able to plant some native wildflowers on those right of ways. Um, so that's at the city, county, and the privately owned level. Um, and we touched on this quite a bit. Um, we really have to start thinking about people rethinking habitat. A lot of people are used to maintaining those cool season grasses on their lawns. So we have to train them to think about managing for warm season grasses and um, native wildflowers. Um, the diversity versus uniformity, we've kind of said this multiple times, that diversity is key. <laughs> and the idea of native versus non-native, there's just so many more benefits to planting native versus non-native. Recalibrating the idea of tolerating messiness, quote unquote. So minimizing that turf grass, allowing for natural decomposition, minimizing the pesticide use. And if you're planting native, you're really saving time, money, and energy in maintaining those areas anyway, because they don't require the same amount of watering, uh, pesticide application, mowing, those types of things. Um, and it's a really hard thing to do because their ancient Rome has like the whole concept of an organized lawn and yard and things like that. So it's really been ingrained for for long, long, long time and across a lot of different belief backgrounds, cultural backgrounds. So it's going to be a really big challenge to really talk to people about that. And as we've already talked to, uh, before, planning for all four seasons, think about the long-term impact using educational signage and pathways. In urban areas, um, a lot of people don't like the idea of um, using herbicide, but as we all know, and it's very important that especially if you're using seed, you need that good seed to soil contact to make habitat uh, come up well. But a lot of times people don't like the idea of herbicide and tillage is often not usually feasible on a lot of the sites because they're just so small. So some things that I have found that could be helpful, things like sod removal, which is really good for small sites. It's pretty cost effective. The only downside is, it, is it, that it can be labor intensive and but it's really beneficial in that fast site prep if people don't have a full year to get their site ready to go. Um, the only downside is it doesn't work for things like Bermuda grasses, which I'm seeing are more and more common. Another um, option is solarization. I've also seen it called smothering, soil sterilization, light exclusion, whatever you want to call it. Um, this can be really helpful in small, flat, sunny sites, especially people are 100% adamant that they can't use chemicals. Um, the downside of this, it can take a really long time, um, but you could arguably reuse the plastic, but there is also the risk of killing some microorganisms in the soil. So as with every site prep method, there's a lot of uh, pros and cons to each method. And um, at Xerxes.org, they actually have a really good list of organic site prep methods that talk about which option may be best. So I would encourage people to check that out. Um, and then some common backyard mistakes that I see often is the soil is really deeply disturbed. So people think they're turning that soil, but that can strip the native or the, the existing seed bank, which may often have some of the stuff we don't want. Um, they also like to prepare with fertilizer, which again can encourage competition with things we do not want. And for me, the unrealistic timeline, I think as um, biologists across the board and different agencies, we kind of create this idea that you can have it instantly, but as we all know, especially from seed, it takes time and love and patience to put those plants in the ground. So I think it's really important to be honest with people about the timeline so that way they don't get halfway into the project thinking it would be awesome overnight and then they're really just disappointed. Again, telling them the value of good site prep because it's, it's universal for seeds, for plugs, for trees, for shrubs, what have you. Um, a lot of people often reach out to put habitat in the ground in the middle of the summer when they want to be outside and whatever you're transplanting, they usually don't like to be trans transplanted in the heat of the day. So if we can start talking to people earlier um, to maybe start prepping, you know, in the fall and then start seeding in the winter, those are things to think about. Again, people are so used to spraying the weeds and things like cool season grasses, but we have to start changing them to think about warm season grasses and native flowers. <clears throat> Another really big thing that's come up a lot more recently for me 
is a lot of people think all seeds are created equally. I have had people that said, well, I got a native seed packet that was good for the Midwest. Why is nothing growing? Well, and I went to the website and I looked at it and it contained things like Siberian wallflower, I think it's Oregon poppy. So things that are beautiful where they're from, but maybe not appropriate for Indiana soil. And we obviously don't want anything spreading um, and causing an invasive situation. And the other big thing is uh, people give up very quickly and they get discouraged quickly if we don't help see what can happen. Um, so I always encourage people to stick with it. As we all know, um, na nature will just prove us absolutely wrong and not work as we wanted it to. But there's ways to adapt and grow. And if something doesn't work, there's, it's really easy to, to pivot and do something different to help get people through that. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Erin. Okay, so now we're going to look at some mowing versus landscaping photos and talk about the benefits and um, things that they've done. So the first photo here, um, if any of you have ever been to downtown Indianapolis, this is um, the Nature Conservancy building. And so they've got some really beautiful plantings in the front and the back. And just kind of reiterating some of the points that we mentioned before, um, Jessica pointed out in one of the previous slides that, you know, having a trail. So this one has a nice walking trail through it that you can see with defined borders in the same, um, it's got defined borders at the edge and um, it still serves a purpose just like, you know, a larger scale planting does. As you can see, they've also used mulch in between the plants until the plants get big enough to kind of overtake or, um, you know, kind of fill in. Um, that mulch gives it an intent looking of, hey, this is intentionally something we planted. Okay. Um, we saw this earlier and Jessica talked a really good bit about the background behind this site. So I, it's just really neat. We talked about um, unrealistic timelines. And, you know, when you look at that middle photo that was the first year after it was first installed, you know, a lot of people, especially um, who aren't familiar may walk by and go, oh, what did they do? This doesn't, you know. And so it's, this is where having nice educational signage at the site helps um, to let people know, hey, this is a work in progress and it will get better because you can see in the last photo, it looks beautiful. No, okay. So this is the same site as the prior, um, but they continued the planting on down. So you can kind of see where the houses are. That's where the walkway is but the planting continues all the way down next to the road. And so there's educational signage next to the road to kind of let people who are driving by know, um, especially like at this time of year, it looks gorgeous with all these wonderful pollinator plants. But, you know, in the summer or in the winter time, the general person may not, you know, they don't see the flowers and they may think, oh, but the signs will help even in when the flowers aren't blooming and it's not beautiful and popping, um, at least not to them or the, you know, aesthetically, the signs will help, hey, this is intentional, this is providing habitat. Okay. Uh, so this is an example of a rain garden project that was worked on. And so even with this one, we have the educational signage component. We have defined edge. This is at an intersection uh, in Indianapolis of, of two really um, populated road areas. And so it's beautiful. It has since filled in even more since this photo. And so it does really well and they've received lots of compliments on it. And that's always something that we like and can replicate. And you can see there's still a mowed grass component on the portions that, you know, are more used or more pedestrian traffic. And so you can kind of incorporate both a landscaping technique as well as mowing in areas where necessary. Okay. Again, we've seen this photo before. Um, and so kind of um, continuing on with the same thing, this one has a walkway and they mow around the walkway because one of the number one comp complaints that you know were on the thing or one of the mentions was safety and hazards. And so when people walk down this sidewalk, they can still walk down the sidewalk and not be impeded by overhanging vegetation. And it gives it a defined edge and gives it a purpose. So one of the things that um, can be utilized or done when uh, starting a project in that first year when um, it may not look the best that can help with indicating intent, maybe putting up a fence. And it has uh, a two, twofold pr uh, purpose here in that this fence was helped 
put up to help prevent geese from coming up and snipping off the plants as they were growing. But it also helps provide intent that, hey, this may not look the prettiest right now, but it's a work in progress and it's here for a reason. Okay. So the next few slides or few pictures. This is an example of a yard project that uh, was taken on. So this is uh, a yard. This was the before photo. And so we've got a little bit of a timeline here. It takes place within over a year of the process of converting this small little piece of yard into um, a pollinator type yard. And so you click the next. So this one is in April 2016. The first one was March, sorry. And so you can see this has uh, been, this is after a glyphosate has been applied. And so the yard doesn't look so great, but it's got a purpose. And then after that is May, um, the person went and selected plugs because as Jessica mentioned, seeds tend to take a little longer. So they wanted to do plugs to have more of a, a instantaneous result. And so the plugs are in. This is July, and so you can click the next, and there should be, so this is within the first year. And if you use seeds, like you can see Culver's root here uh, to the left, if you use seeds, you would not get Culver's root, within, Culver's root within the first year. So that's one of the benefits of using plugs versus seeds. Um, they can be a little more costly, so it all depends on what the landowner has budget-wise. Next, so this is August. So you can see we've got some milkweed coming up. Um, next, this is September, and if you click one more, we've got some, yep, so Jessica mentioned um, some of the species that you may get that are volunteer species but still provide excellent benefits to pollinators, so we've got ironweed here, and so it's just showing we've got quite a few blooms. It's still kind of a little rough looking on the edges um, if you look at it from afar, but it has a purpose and educational signage can help when people draw, walk by this to go, oh, this is kind of cool. And it's important to also note, like Jessica said, having a realistic timeline. Next. And knowing that within the first year, it can look a little rough, but it will get better and it will look awesome in the end. You just gotta have patience. So you can see here, the plants are definitely starting to fill in. They're looking really nice. And then this one is Mar or, uh, March of 2017. So this is almost a year later. This is what it looks like um, starting the next growing season. And then you click the next, this is April. So you can really see the plants are jumping up. And then if you go to the next slide, this is what it looked like after two growing seasons. Got your wonderful educational signage. We have a defined border around it. Um, and you can see we definitely kept the plants away from the edge, they don't overhang. So people who are walking by can observe the plants, probably even see some of the awesome pollinators on there and not have their you know, walk impeded in any way and should be no safety problems. And if you click one more, there's a wonderful, be be sorry, wonderful before and after uh, photo of the site. So you can just kind of see the overall difference, um, which is kind of unique. Next slide. So if you have any resource or if you are looking for any resources, um, any landowners who are looking for anything, they can go to wildlife.in.gov. Uh, as Jessica had, um, I think in the chat provided earlier, we have seed supplier lists, we have habitat fact sheets, there's biologists that are free resources to landowners that we can help out. Um, there's also webinars on information. And as she mentioned before, we may have potential cost share funding available depending upon the situation and the location. Next. And so with that, I will wrap it up. And if you have any questions, thank you. Thank you both so much. That was so much information. Um, very much appreciated. There was one request. There's been, again, everyone check out the chat. Some great conversations going on there. Um, Jessica or Aaron, could one of you share the link for how, how to find the ordinances into the chat? There was a request for that. I can, uh, Aaron, I'll, I'll let you take that since that's kind of what you took on. Okay. Yeah, I usually just kind of, um, I just kind of Googled some of the different cities and that kind of popped up. So that might be something you can do, but um, I can look up and see if there's anything and put that in the chat. 
Okay. Um, there's a lot of questions for those interested in where to find some signage in addition to the ones mentioned in the presentation. So definitely check those out. Do you have a question from earlier that says, are you aware of any existing organizations or nonprofits that seek to acquire urban suburban land as set aside habitat? This may be back to both our um, the earlier presentation as well as yours. So Erin Stump as well as Erin and Jessica, do you have any thoughts on that? I am not aware of anything. I was saying the only thing that's coming to mind is acres and I really don't know their process. I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic to Jared and we're going to talk more in depth, although we've covered it throughout the day, but some more in depth into some of the resources that are available out there. So Jared. Hello and good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Jared O'Brien and I'm with the Pollinator Partnership. So to follow those great presentations, what I'm going to do is talk first a little bit about our organization and then follow that up with some of the programs and resources that might be helpful to you all um, when looking at and considering backyard habitat. So here we go. So the Pollinator Partnership is a nonprofit um, largely concerned with protecting pollinators through conservation, education, research. You, you could see some other project mission areas there listed in the, uh, in the honeycomb. And uh, a few of the signature initiatives that some of you might be familiar with uh, would be the North American uh, Pollinator Protection Campaign, or NAPSI, um, National Pollinator Week, which was actually um, stemmed as a project from the Pollinator Partnership. And we see a lot of that on social media here, probably a few months out. And another thing that I'll touch on a little bit later is the eco-regional planting guides, which I personally think are a tremendous resource. So as we get into the programs, I will, I will say that each one of these that I talk about briefly warrant more than a single slide. Um, I would implore all of you to check out the website, that's pollinator.org. Uh, I think it's, it's very intuitive and I hope you'll find it the same. Um, but so this Be Smart School Kit largely, I guess, would be a, useful for SWCDs and any school programs or educational outreach activities that they have. Um, this is largely to connect kids to uh, plants, pollinators, and how they, um, how they lead, lend themselves to food and gardens. So if you already have a great in-school program like Michelle has in Porter County, then you're probably already incorporating something similar along these lines, but this is definitely another tool that you could have in the toolbox. And other educational resources that are on this website um, so there's everything from different land uses to different sectors in here. Um, really, you, you could spend a lot of time and learn a lot just visiting their learning center. So Project Wingspan, this is something that Jessica touched on earlier. Uh, she did mention that she thought it was wrapping up, and I believe that they are going to continue it this time with a focus on ag or working lands, which is specifically exciting to Indiana and everyone on this call here. So it's, it's concerned with conservation and volunteer efforts and basically looking at the Midwest and the Great Lakes landscape to help enhance diversity and provide uh, beneficial habitat. So some of the, some of the efforts is in different areas would be congregating a group of volunteers, teaching them about plant ID, educating them on seed collection and the methods. Um, and in addition to that, they would also provide some of the seed collected and cleaned, which I believe is cleaned in Mason State Nursery in Illinois. Um, then they would actually supply that to different landowners. And so as we look at this, this ag one that might be ramping up here soon, again, I'm pretty excited about that. So in addition to just providing some seed, um, they'll, they'll also put on technical trainings and um, again, workshops for a lot of volunteers um, just to learn more. So I see this being very beneficial to, you know, any private landowners that are looking to do more um, with their property, small or large. Another one I want to touch on here is this Million Pollinator Garden Challenge and open to a variety of landowners, anyone with land to influence really. So 
more or less, this is a call to action to preserve and create gardens that are gonna benefit pollinators. Um, again, on the website, tons of technical info that landowners can visit um, to kind of help get them started from selection to site prep. And, you know, once established, participants can register and put their garden um, on the map here that you see. So, you know, putting a pin on a map to kind of showcase the work that you've done and have a sense of pride in that. So one of the flagship programs that is definitely being ramped up, this is Bee Friendly Farming. And so there's some basic criteria for it, but what I really wanted to talk about is how this can be used in backyard habitat. So while for farming, it's probably more is like a marketing tool, right? Another logo you could use similar to something like Indiana Grown that a lot of us might be familiar with. But for the sake of this talk, they also have a garden um, category. So just like many of the other um, certification processes or recognition programs, um, here's one that's from the Pollinator Partnership. And again, the signage can go a long way, especially as we start to get these um, these sites established, we all know what they look like in year one. So jumping into some publications and resources that the Pollinator Partnership offers. There's a ton of them. I have a ton of printouts. Um, you know, as, as we move forward and could perhaps do some more in-person stuff, these are great to have on a table, especially if you're doing anything focused around pollinator habitat. So on the left, they have these pollinator garden cards. Um, this is pictured as the Midwest region one. There are also more for um, different regions of the US. Tons of free downloadable brochures that cover a variety of topics. And then again, those eco region guides that are pictured on the bottom right. So talking about those eco regional plant guides, the Indiana specific ones are, that, that touch our state are gonna be the Prairie Parkland one and the Eastern Broadleaf Forest Guide. So on the website, they have a really easy um, tool where you just type in essentially your zip code and it'll pull up which one is for your area. But generally speaking, um, looking at that map and what's, what color is shaded in for Indiana, you might have a, a best guess based on where you're at. So these have, they're 20 pages. There's a ton of information in there. Additional resources, um, again, you know, for native plants for a small yard, that's a, that's a really long and in-depth um, document. So these, these are just screenshots actually from the Porter County website, kind of just having, hosting a lot of documents out there. As you'll see, there's no shortage of guidance documents when it comes to pollinators. So when you're kind of as an SWCD or NRCS walking that line of becoming their landscaper versus helping them, um, some of these guides might be might be really beneficial. Um, and of course, you know, the crew in Marion County has been putting out some really great publications as it pertains to native plantings, also beneficial insects. Uh, again, so there's just there's just tons of, of documents out there. So on the left, you'll see some from Xerces. Um, one's general pollinator, one's monarch. Uh, there's a USDA NRCS one for pollinator gardens, which I think is great. Purdue has an awesome publication too that lists the columns and any associations that the, uh, the native Forbes might have. And then again, the pollinator partnership ones got so nice, I had to show them twice. So as a quick wrap up, here's some logos, different programs, initiatives. So the pollinator partnership is really all things pollinator. The one thing it is not is financial assistance and cost share. And for that, I'm glad that uh, Jessica mentioned a few other opportunities that are out there. So additional certification programs, this is not exhaustive at all. I know there are a lot more. And so a few, depending on which area of the state you're in, um, you might have, um, I guess, more relevance to the Shirley Hines one, the Red Tail Land Conservancy. Um, I'm not sure if Niches has one or Acres. Um, Indian Native Plant Society, of course, the Monarch Way Station, and then Xerces Society. And I failed to have a, a picture up here of an SWCD one, but um, as Claire mentioned in the chat before, they have signs and Porter County has a pollinator partner sign that's pretty sharp. 
And so I'm just going to end that right there. This is my attempt at some humor here. The monarch gets a lot of attention, but you know, the, the bee that's vandalizing this picture that I actually took of a mural that was painted in Benton County, if anyone's ever seen that passing through Fowler. Aaron Stump, did you have anything else you wanted to share regarding some of the resources available out there? I know you shared quite a bit in your presentation earlier. I'm happy to share any resources I mentioned if I didn't give. I know I didn't uh, put any links down there, but if, if anybody wants, I can share. You know, we have a, a campus certification program too, if you're interested in seeing what campuses are doing, because we're trying to branch out from backyard. The reason we dropped the word backyard was just because we want to include office spaces and campuses and community spaces and churches and stuff like that too. Um, but you can pretty much find it all on our, on our website um, if you're interested in that, but I'm happy to provide links to anything specific if I left it out. 